Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. In this episode, I'm talking with David Hoinsky. David is a philosopher. He has a PhD in philosophy, and he's a professor at West Virginia University. In this episode, we talk about a whole bunch of things. We talk about philosophy in general. We talk about Nietzsche. Uh, we talk a little bit about Heidegger as well. Uh, we start the conversation with how philosophical ideas are connected with the philosopher's life and how autobiographical elements can inform some of their ideas. This is some of the work David's done um, personally and so, or in his research. And so he, he really explains um, how that looks. And so this is a really nice section of the conversation. We talk, give a broad overview of continental and analytic philosophy. I've talked about that before on the podcast. And so I'm um, really trying to hone down kind of the broad brushstrokes of what that looks like. And so we give a explanation of analytic philosophy. We give an explanation of continental philosophy and then how they work together, how they're similar and dissimilar. Um, we also talk about how philosophy works through time and how each uh, philosopher builds on the previous one, especially within continental philosophy. And so we give kind of this idea of it used as a hyperlink. Then we launch into a discussion about Friedrich Nietzsche, who was a philosopher at the turn of the century. We talk about his background and some of his, you know, historical kinds of data. We talk about his concept of will to power. We talk about his concept of the eternal recurrence of the same. We discuss Nietzsche's ideas about value and religion. And then we talk about Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra, which is one of his major uh, pieces that he wrote. And, you know, I really find that this conversation was really, I think, can be really helpful for people that, you know, maybe have read a little bit of Nietzsche and know a few ideas or some cool quotations, but, you know, Hopefully this, you know, especially the way David explains it so well, it gives a very nice introductory and somewhat a little bit more depth into um, how we understand Nietzsche as a person and then how we understand his ideas and his thoughts, especially in the Zarathustra. So we didn't talk about Heidegger. Uh, we talked about um, Heidegger on Nietzsche, right, and some of his uh, lectures that he provided. Um, we We kind of got kind of got lost and stuck in Heidegger. And so we talked about Heidegger um, himself. And we so we talked about Heidegger's problems with his personal life and his politics and, um, you know, some of the the tricky things about that. So it's just some really good questions we pose in there. Then we talked about this this question that, you know, to be honest, I'm I'm still thinking about, you know, is should philosophers be good? And you know, I don't have an answer for that. And it's a great question that David posed. And, you know, I'd be curious to hear other people's thoughts um, and, and, you know, on this important question. And finally, we end on the pragmatic elements of philosophy itself in society and kind of how people are doing philosophy, whether they recognize it or not. So I really love this conversation. David is you know, it's such a, he's such a genial, wonderful, and smart person, and he has such a good understanding of the history of philosophy and some of the further tenets of some of these big thinkers. And um, yeah, it, this was a great conversation. And uh, so now I bring you David Hoinsky. I am here with David Hoinsky. David, what's going on, man? Hey, how you doing, Xavier? I'm doing very well. I uh, I appreciate you coming on, and and uh, I've been wanting to talk to you kind of long form for a while. I, I follow you online, and so I was like, man, I gotta I gotta get David on here. So I'm I'm really grateful you to you agreed. Thanks. Well, I really appreciate the invitation. Yeah. So tell uh tell listeners um who you are, um kind of what you do at the moment, uh what your what you study, your expertise, um, anything that you're working on, and uh, many other kind of future endeavors. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I'm a philosopher. Um I uh you know, I did I did my MPhil at KU Leuven in uh, in Belgium. I did my PhD at uh, Duquesne University in Pittsburgh. Um and uh I wrote my dissertation on the the use of uh, how philosophers have used autobiography to do philosophy. 
Hmm. I really got a lot into this question of like the sort of literary genres that philosophers use. Hmm. Um, And of course, autobiography in particular, which they're trying to sort of bring their own lives into, um, into an account of their philosophy and sort of, I I think especially like their principles, sort of their fundamental beliefs. Mm -hmm. Um, So, which are always hard to talk about. I mean, where do fundamental, how do you get to fundamental beliefs or, um, and uh, yeah, and I, you know, I currently, I teach uh, for the past few years, I teach at West Virginia University in Morgantown. I teach, uh, I'm sort of the department utility player, you know, Mm -hmm. um, like insofar as I have an ac- like a sort of specialized area of specialization, it's pretty much ancient philosophy. So like most of my publications are on Plato and Aristotle, uh, but I've re- written on Nietzsche and nihilism and Camus. So I sort of have this interest in, I don't know what you might call sort of this existentialism. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I mean, I teach, I've, I teach pretty much everything. Like I teach modern philosophy, ancient philosophy, political philosophy, uh philosophy of law and then of wow. course in the sort, sort of introductory courses as well and then i i i managed to do these seminars sometimes for seniors so like you know the most recent ones i've done we did a whole semester on spinoza's ethics oh cool that's yeah cool. which is great and you know you go you go into the class and it's this little book right and you know <laughs> the students are sort of amazed we're going to spend all semester on this little oh, book man, you could spend many semesters on that book <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> So it was really great to see um, to see their surprise there. And then prior to Spinoza, I did a did a semester on Nietzsche's Zarathustra. Mm, nice, nice. And that's pretty much all we did. We did a little, you know, we read some Camus on Nietzsche. We read some Heidegger on Nietzsche. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I know a lot about Nietzsche's background, so we did talked about that. But mostly, we just did Zarathustra all semester, which was which was yeah uh, really weird and awesome. <laughs> right. No, that that's great. Um, so, I mean, yeah, you have a lot of really cool uh, backgrounds and experiences and stuff. So I think the conversation will be really, really nice. Uh, real quick, I had um, recently um, Iona Italia on here. I haven't released it yet, but I will in a couple of weeks. And we had a cool conversation about this kind of difference between autobiography and memoirs, right? And she's written a few memoirs and and we talked a little bit about autobiography. And so maybe just because you brought it up, I, I'm curious for your uh, kind of ideas about, you know, in terms of, you know, maybe philosophers use uh, or can or have used autobiographical kind of literary kind of technique of sorts of doing that. You know, how do you see that as somewhat uh, helpful or I guess a good tool or good method of sometimes of using uh, to to illustrate some of their ideas or or the like. Well, I think I mean, I think it's very cool that you know they're trying to show how philosophy is connected with life. Yeah, I mean it advances a certain conception of philosophy, right? I mean, philosophy is not just a sort of you know. I mean, we might tend to think of it as a, as primarily a profession. You know, it's something you do uh, during the day and then you shut it. You know, sort of shut it off. Whereas mm-hmm. I think, you know, um, I mean, you think of like work by like Pierre Hadot, mm-hmm. uh, the great scholar of the great French scholar of uh, of ancient philosophy, right. who really focused on this idea of philosophy as a way of life, right? That like, yeah. stoicism was a way of life, for example, or like being in Plato's Academy was a kind of way of life uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so that it was really like, you know, uh, I mean... So philosophy wasn't sort of this, you know, activity that was somehow abstracted from like being human and living in the world, but it was something that was supposed to be sort of integral to that. Mm -hmm. And I think you see that in these philosophical autobiographies, right? Like they're trying to show how they sort of lived their problems and came to certain, you know, conclusions that helped them to like go forward. Yeah. I think um, Nietzsche definitely does an element of this. Um, who yeah, are, definitely. Who are other people um, that kind of have a, just for listeners that have a, a sense of an idea of who does this, I guess, at, at all, and maybe who does it well, or where do, where do we see this in philosophy, I think, uh, a little bit? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, it's it's great that you bring up Nietzsche, I mean, first of all, because, I mean, he's very, very much, very much a, a an autobiographical, but also a, a uh, 
a philosopher who's very interested in biography, mm-hmm. right? You know, I mean, sometimes he says things like, you know, all, all of the philosopher's doctrines are ultimately refuted, but what yeah. what's never refuted is their lives. Right. Um, or, you know, he'll say things like this, this famous passage from Beyond Good and Evil, which I'm sure you know, where he says, you know, every philosophy is really sort of the unacknowledged, mm-hmm. or the unconscious confession of its author. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Know, uh, memoir, I think mm-hmm. he says there. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. And of course, he wrote a kind of weird autobiography, Ecce Homo. Ecce Homo, yeah. Yeah. It's a strange. It doesn't book. conform to the sort of usual. Uh, <laughs> the usual form of the genre. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it has these great chapter titles. Like, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, it's a strange book. I read it uh, last year. I reread it last year. I hadn't read it in a while. And, and it just, it's interesting. Um, it's strange. I also think that there's this like weird with, with Nietzsche's life. He, he wrote a lot about Wagner and he wrote a lot about um, Schopenhauer. And, but it's always kind of like his, you kind of through his writing see his evolution and how he progressed with like his idea and his thought writing about those guys. And so that's maybe another way or tool in which he talks about that. Yeah, I mean, they were both so hugely influential for him. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I don't know what he discovered Schopenhauer in some secondhand bookshop mm-hmm. in Leipzig, I think. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe it was Bonn. But, uh, I mean, you know, and what he went straight home and read it and just changed his life. <laughs> yeah. It's just a completely life changing experience for him. Mm-hmm. And then Wagner, you know, of course, he had a personal relationship with Wagner. Right. And uh, so it was hugely influential for him. And Nietzsche always cared a lot about music. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I would say, I would say he definitely cared about art in general and yeah. more specifically music uh, in particular. So, which, which is also, a wonderful uh, contribution that he had. What, can you, and just to, to close this point, who are some other people you can think of or other philosophers? Yeah, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I didn't really do a good job of answering that. But, <laughs> no, it's okay, it's okay. But, you know, um, I mean, I think that some of the obvious ones are like Augustine, the Confessions, yep. uh, Rousseau's Confessions. So, and of course, Rousseau titles it the Confessions because in a way it's supposed to be an answer to Augustine. Mm-hmm. Um, I read Descartes' discourse on the map. I mean, I don't think this is uh, very uh, too daring on my part, but I read Descartes' discourse on the method as autobiographical. Hmm. Uh, And what's a bit maybe more, which what's maybe a bit more controversial is that I I find philosophical autobiography in Plato. So like Socrates. How so? Yeah, like Socrates gives an autobiography, for example, probably the best example is in the Phaedo, mm-hmm. uh, which mm-hmm. uh, the British pronounce Phaedo. Uh, but uh, the, um, but he, so- Socrates gives a kind of autobiography in that dialogue, which of course presents, you know, it's supposed to depict the conversation that took place on the day that Socrates was to die. You know, he's mm-hmm. going to drink the hemlock at the end of the dialogue. Mm-hmm. Uh, but before that, he gives an autobiography and he basically tells about what he was interested in when he was young. Um, uh, so wh- uh, what is it? Uh, uh, Historia, uh, I guess, Fuseos, uh, uh, study of nature. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, so he talks about like, oh, I basically began as a kind of natural scientist, but I realized that it couldn't answer certain questions for me. Hmm. And so therefore, you know, I realized I needed to take another approach. Hmm. Uh, and, um, and so he basically sort of explains his own evolution as a philosopher in that dialogue. Of course, it's weird because like, he's not writing it, he's speaking it. And it's not, I mean, did Socrates actually say this? Probably not. Plato's right. making it up. <laughs> right. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's, it is an autobiography in the sense that like he tells a story about his own life and development and how he sort of came to his ultimate philosophical position. Hmm. And you know, I've never thought of it that way. So I, and I can totally see that. And just before we, we, you know, uh, shift gears here, what is the, what is, in your mind, what do you think is the, uh, I guess the utility or the, the purpose for 
looking at some of philosophy sort of through an autobiographical lens. Like how would you, you're positing that it's a good thing and that it's, it's helpful. Yeah. I mean, I guess I would just again, sort of like point to the idea that it's showing how philosophy is connected with life hmm. that it's, um, and I think, you know, um, yeah, but of course, if you think about other disciplines, I mean, you know, why why do people have the interests they have? I mean, if someone's passionate about physics or mathematics or, um, I mean, somehow that seems, it seems like it's it's central to their life in the same way. Um, but, you know, I don't know. I mean, you know, Nietzsche always said like, look, I don't, I'm not interested in these sort of abstract problems. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I only concern myself with problems that I live. Mm-hmm. You know, like I want to live my problems, or, um, and so yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I think there's something. Well, you sort of see how philosophy is uh, can be integral to life, like through this. I think that's what this like particular literary form is. Mm-hmm. trying to trying to show us yeah i i agree i think the thing that's so nice about it is trying to say hey you know philosophy isn't just a, a group of ideas or it's this abstract thing that we remove from ourselves or you know that and again this is you know we'll we'll, we'll get into nietzsche uh, in a bit but and that's one of the things I love about Nietzsche is Nietzsche, to me, his philosophy is a philosophy of life. And, and that's really what he's trying to do, doing life and living life. And I think so many people in society, they just see philosophy as, you know, a bunch of, you know, highbrow, abstract, circular reasoning, that kind of stuff. And I think philosophy isn't that. And we have to have in society, we, I mean, we, my thing is people do philosophy all the time and they don't realize it, right? And I think if you are able to understand right. some of the tough concepts, you're able to understand better or potentially better how how life is and some of the problems in life. And so I think that's the power of it. And so I had never thought about it in terms of the autobiographical lens. And so that's um, that's uh, that's very, very nice to think of it that way. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's 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 sort of, it's not easy being human. I think. Mm-mm. And um it sucks half the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it sucks a lot of the time. And um you know, I mean it's uh I keep using the word weird today, but it's weird that we're here at all. I mean, like um like as individuals, right? Like that I'm here at all. It's sort of a strange yeah. occurrence. Um and and so far as we know, it's only going to happen once. Right. So, you know, it's not coming back. It's not coming back unless the eternal recurrence is literally <laughs> true. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Um, you know, and so, and we, you know, sort of all have to confront death. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, obviously that's a peculiarity of being human is that we're sort of aware of that ahead of time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Heidegger's pretty good on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. Uh, yeah. So go ahead. But. So, so, so yeah. So before we get to Nietzsche, I wanted to, um, I, I feel like I would be, uh, in error if I didn't ask you from basically just, you know, cause of your, uh, training and what you teach. Um, there's this, I th- I, well, my understanding is that there's uh, actually three schools of thought, but maybe you can, um, yeah, me. but there's, um, and, and this may seem sort of a, kind of a nerd moment between <laughs> two people at the moment, but I think it's important. There is basically within philosophy, you have continental philosophy, analytic philosophy, and is it pragmatism? No. Um, yeah, I guess you could say American pragmatism or like yeah. sometimes yeah. considered to be a third so, school. Yeah. So, so maybe just kind of give us the overview of each of the schools and some of the folks there and major tenants and some of that stuff. So we can have a kind of, um, uh, because I think that, that's going to be really key for them when we talk about Nietzsche for very, cause he's very much at a crossroads moment in, in philosophy, I think. So yeah, Nietzsche we, really is a, a, a crossroads moment. And, I, and one of the things that's interesting about Nietzsche is that like you have analytic interpretations of Nietzsche and you have yes. mental interpretations. <laughs> of Nietzsche. And, yes. Yeah. Um, you know, there are, 
there, there are a lot of different ways of approaching uh, Nietzsche. I, I always um, say that Nietzsche is, I think I said this, uh, I don't remember when I said that. I said it recently, but Nietzsche is the the Beethoven for philosophy because Beethoven was the key between uh, is it uh, romanticism and um, I always forget the period before that. Be Beethoven had his foot in two periods of music, and I can't remember the first one at the moment. Well, maybe classicism or like classic. it might be classic, classic, classical, but I know it's romanticism. He was like the he like introduced that whole like. Uh, yeah, you have the, you have this distinction between like romanticism and classicism. Yeah. Um. So I don't know. Yeah, but I know what you're talking about for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. I always see. Yeah, I always think of Mozart as really sort of the transitional figure between. Oh, yeah, between I like can see Bach that too. And yeah, yeah, I can see that because Bach was Baruch. Oof. Oh. I don't know. We shouldn't talk about this because I don't know. Anything. I, yeah, I don't. I don't know music theory as much as I. Well, I've been listening like to, to the Fifth Symphony a lot lately. I don't know <laughs> for some reason. I don't know. So tell us about the the three schools of philosophy. Yeah. Um. So you know, I mean, one thing to say is that it's it's interesting that that uh, Nietzsche has a presence in analytic philosophy. Mm -hmm. I think much more so than some other thinkers who are like prominent in the continental tradition, but sort of don't really figure much at all in analytic mm -hmm. so, you know like hey uh it's changing a little bit but traditionally hegel was sort of a an author that the analytic philosophers stayed away from <laughs> yeah yeah and uh of course you know and then you know you have uh, like 20 later 20th century figures like Heide you know even husserl and heidegger and uh, mm -hmm. uh derrida mm -hmm. and of course there are always exceptions you know you have the uh, Samuel Wheeler at Connecticut wrote a book on Donald Davidson and Derrida hmm. comparing their two philosophies. The book is called uh, Deconstruction as Analytic Philosophy. Sort of <laughs> neat experiment. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, um, I mean, analytic philosophy, it has a pretty complicated history, is mm -hmm. one thing to say. Um, it's definitely the dominant school of philosophy in the United States at this point. And by that, I mean, like especially institutionally, like so most programs in the United States are predominantly analytic mm -hmm. of that orientation. Um, you know, uh, and and it sort of ends up, you know, dominating the the major association, professional association for philosophers, which is the American Philosophical Association. Um, you know, that's not to say that it's the only presence, but it's definitely the um the predominant one and then you know you have some programs in the united states like uh that are more pluralistic so mm. that's becoming a bit more of a trend i think and i think for me you know from my point of view that's a good thing that's positive yeah you know so where you have a mix of like analytic and continental um and then you know you have sort of you have some department you have a few departments that have been traditionally continentally oriented mm. so like duquesne uh, in Pittsburgh, where I went, is, is uh, has a definite continental orientation. Penn State, um, uh, well, and some others. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, so I mean, analytic philosophy is sort of uh, institutionally really the dominant mode. And then, as you mentioned, like there is, uh, you know, there are lots of other little schools. American pragmatism is one of them. So you sort of have, like, you know, um, uh, Peirce and Dewey and James and so forth. Right. Uh, and that, um, but that's sort of a minor, I think, tradition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so maybe, so maybe help us then for, for, for listeners, how would you define or explain analytic philosophy and, and what their conceptually, what their big ideas are? Yeah. I mean, it's really, I think it's not that easy to explain. Yeah. Unfortunately. Um, you know, and one thing to say is that, I mean, for me, in a way, you know, like I sort of, I consider myself a bit of an outsider, like with respect to both traditions. Hmm. Um, you know, uh, another, like we're at Leuven where I studied, which is also continentally oriented. Um, but at Leuven and Duquesne, they're both also very strong history of philosophy programs. Hmm. So uh i really think of myself as doing like primarily history of philosophy or taking a, a taking an approach to philosophy through history of philosophy so i'm not saying that i'm only interested in history but i'm saying that like that's sort of how i orient myself towards sure. problems of the present 
Uh, all right, so let, let's say real quickly a few things about analytic philosophy. Sure, sure. It comes from, it primarily comes from um, England, hmm. but but also uh, also there's a heavy influence from this Vienna circle, which I'm sure you know, and that's associated with sort of lo- logical positivism and uh, Schlick and Carnap and uh, Neurath and these people, and of course Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein was sort of a yeah. fellow traveler for yeah. a while, or um i just i just reread the tractatus uh that is that is a a, a amazing book but very difficult <laughs> yeah and i think the vienna circle really liked that book and then they weren't sure so much about his later his later stuff yeah stuff. The blue and brown book and then the uh was it on certainty and all that stuff um so but you know i mean a big part like you had this tradition of so-called british idealism mm-hmm which like Bertrand Russell and um, G. Moore reacted against. Mm-hmm. And so, and I don't know, so like they got interested in imp- empiricism uh, and, you know, there was a, obviously a very great interest in mathematics. Mm-hmm. So, you know, part of this project of, uh, well, that comes from Frege and Russell too, was trying to like, ground mathematics and logic Mm -hmm. um and then uh so you know but i mean so this was this was part of the the project and then there were like sort of later moments as well like so you could say like so uh, around the same time like husserl and frega are corresponding Mm -hmm. and they're both working on similar kinds of questions like foundations of mathematics, foundations of geometry. Mm-hmm. Um, they're interested in sort of the foundations of the sciences as such. Uh, but of course they take sort of very different paths and Husserl develops phenomenology. Right. Uh, and so, you know, and part of what phenomenology is doing is like trying to give descriptions of, uh, well, give descriptions of the world yeah it's trying to explain experience yeah we're trying to yeah it's trying to talk about I mean, in a way you can think about it as like well we're trying to talk about what what actually goes on when we reflect on our knowledge or whatever we're trying mm-hmm. to give like a really um and so in a way it encourages a kind of subjective turn right because like now mm-hmm. i'm thinking about like i'm thinking about my own thinking or i'm thinking about my own consciousness and you know, like Heidegger takes this up and develops it in a certain way, right. and then you see this also in Sartre and De Beauvoir and Camus, the ex- sort of existentialist tradition, other figures, right. of course, in Levinas as well. So, um, so continental philosophy sort of gets interested in looking at the world like subjectively right because like there's no getting around subjective experience right we have to start with consciousness in some way Mm -hmm. um whereas you know analytic philosophy doesn't really take that route at all um what's analytic philosophy trying to do i mean again it's really complex you think about like the logical empiricists logical positivists mm-hmm. um you know i mean they have a lot in common with early empiricists right like lot like john locke for example you know they want to if you can't somehow sort of trace things back to experience then they're meaningless right um so you know it's it's a kind of updated version of that project and you know it sort of gets them into this like and that it sort of gets them into this weird position of being like the the meaning police you know like you're talking uh you're talking sense you're talking nonsense Mm -hmm. you know the story about uh the night this 1929 debate between heidegger and kassir at davos no i'm not familiar with this yeah it's, it's interesting there's been some good books about it it's been a while since i studied it but um, but a lot of people were there, and Carnap was there in attendance oh, really? at this debate. Hmm. And supposedly, after the debate, Carnap goes home, and they ask him, uh, you know, well, how how was Heidegger? You know? 
And Carnap says, beep, boop, bop. <laughs> of course, meanwhile, you know, most of the people who were there thought like, wow, like, you know, Heidegger funny. was really impressive. You know? mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Kassira didn't, you know, just really paled mm-hmm. in comparison. <laughs> <clears throat> so, yeah, I think at that point, you know, and then gradually, I think one of the reasons that, you know, like so many intellectual traditions, one of the reasons that uh, logical positivism got such a big foothold in the United States is because, like, you know, a lot of a lot of these intellectuals are Jewish, but, you know, or they were on the left. And so they w- got out of Europe, mm-hmm. uh, you know, during the 30s, you know, to get away from the Nazis. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and it's interesting, like a lot of these early guys, like one of the, one of the best authors on this is this uh, George Reich. Mm-hmm. And he has this one book. I actually, I pulled it out because I knew he wanted to talk about this today. But he has a book called How the Cold War Transformed Philosophy of Science. And the the subtitle is really nice. It's to the icy slopes of logic. Oh wow, that's a nice subtitle. <laughs> um, but but one of the things that's really interesting is like these early analytic guys. I mean Russell too, but Neurot and these others, they were very politically motivated, and they were left. You know, they were on the left. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, they sort of thought like through getting clear about things and. Uh, you know, being objective and using scientific method, whatever that is, as much as possible, right. uh, that we could promote progress and not just sort of material, you know, technological process, but like social pro- progress mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. And so they really had a sort of po- progressive social vision. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that that Reich talks about is that analytic philosophy sort of when it came to the United States and during the Cold War, it was gradually sort of deprived of that political substance. Mm. It was depoliticized. And I think that's when it sort of became a little bit, um, you know, it sort of became, I think it lost touch with the world a bit and Mm. sort of got into its own. It turned into a kind of scholasticism. Yeah. think You know, kind of neo-scholasticism, this kind of thing that the, the Renaissance humanists were protesting against in, 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 in like the 15th uh, century. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so it's this very sort of, I don't know, inward looking uh, sort of uh, hermetic uh, community. And I mean, to this day, you sort of have, you know, I think like I'm not, the, I'm a reasonably smart person, <laughs> but it's, you go to analytic philosophy papers and you just, it's impossible for me to understand that because yeah. they just speak a different language. Like they speak a language <laughs> right. that I don't understand. Right. And some of these people are good friends of mine and I'll be with, you know, we'll just be hanging out or something. And like two of them will start talking in their language <laughs> and they, they might as well start speaking in Mandarin, you mm-hmm. know, because like I would realize that they're communicating, but I don't understand Mandarin. <laughs> I don't understand the analytic philosophy, you know, mm-hmm. like uh, sometimes I joke on Twitter that I want to learn some foreign languages and one of the foreign languages <laughs> is like, it's analytic philosophy. <laughs> um, so, you know, I mean, I think that there's a good, again, and it, again, it's a very complicated tradition. There's lots yes. of interesting work. Yeah. Like I think that Kripke's naming and necessity is going to be a, is a philosophical classic. I mean, mm-hmm. it's just a great book and it's actually wonderfully written and ex- very accessible. Mm-hmm. I think, um, yeah, I think Wilfred Sellers is a super interesting philosopher, but he too can be extremely sort of, uh, abstruse to mm-hmm. use a good David Hume word. <laughs> yeah. so you're just like, Oh, you know, but I think Sellers is very interesting. So there's interesting work going on there. Um, uh, but you know, a lot of it, it, I think is, is pretty inaccessible to the non-specialist. It's pretty highly specialized. Mm -hmm. And, um, and there's also this sort of sense traditionally in analytic philosophy that the way you do philosophy is the paper. Mm -hmm. So you do this well-polished paper, you know, this gem of a paper. Right. You laminate Uh, it and put it in a frame and hang it on the wall and that kind of. Basically, basically. And so, 
and and really it was and it's sort of it's like on the model of natural science right like you make mm-hmm. this little contribution to a particular area you tweak an argument you show like oh there's some problem with this argument and like we could do better this way and it's sort of like i i actually studied an analytic program for my masters mm-hmm. and that was what i was that was sort of the advice my department chair gave me is that like you don't don't try and do everything. Just focus on this little area. It's like natural science, right? Like mm-hmm. we just mm-hmm. move things forward a little bit here and there. Right. It really is on this sort of natural science model. And you know, the question is one question is like how appropriate is that to mm-hmm. philosophy? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, in continental philosophy. So just to maybe bring try and bring up the contrast a little bit. Yeah. I mean, you get you get these sort of, you know, very um, expansive narrative works, you know, so if you think of like Levinas's Totality and Infinity or Heidegger's Being in Time or something like that, I mean, there are these sort of magnum opus works that try to sort of cover important areas of human uh, life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, social life and uh, sort of uh, like the the life that we lead in the privacy of our own consciousness or thought or whatever. Yes. And our inner subjective life. And of course, it's, um, you know, it's much more, uh, I think, you know, it's much more, it's a style, you know, analytic philosophy has its style or styles and continental philosophy has its styles too. And I think, you know, it's, for me, it's much more poetic and, uh, Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, Heidegger, of course, uh, very, uh, you know, very consciously cultivated a connection with poetry. Mm-hmm. He saw that as as one way of sort of bringing truth to light. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, and I mean, it, it, you know, continental philosophy is just cooler, you know, I mean. Yes, I, you, I am, I am know, very, very partial and sympathetic to continental philosophy. <laughs> um but uh you know i mean they still have it's still very professionalized you know they have spep i'm sure you know the mm-hmm. what is it society for phenomenology and existential philosophy or so, so it's like it's that. like the apa but for continental philosophers and yeah yeah with slightly cooler clothes <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and less big beard you know less like uh, gandalf beards so. <laughs> right um and so yeah continental philosophy is doing more of the yeah kind of the big scale you know broad not broad but big scale kind of like looking at everything you know how do we understand this you know how's a structure uh how are we creating a structure or understanding the world or being or or both in a way that is um we're looking at all the facets of it, whereas right analytical analytic philosophy does tend to follow the the natural and somewhat social sciences of how do we just take one piece of this and then just you know we write on this and right you move it forward a little bit and it's very technical and it's very precise and it's very you know kind of the logical piece and so in terms of continental philosophy is it is it just kind of one of those things where they're like mm, I don't want to say like dreamers, right? But they're just <laughs> they're just thinking about the big things and trying to scale that and structure all the big things. Is it something like that? I don't know. I mean, <clears throat> I think that um I mean, that's it's interesting. I don't know. I think you know, maybe maybe one thing to say, one one more thing to say is that um I do think that the history of philosophy plays a much bigger role in continental mm. than in analytic. How so? I mean, again, there are, there are exceptions to this, and there are analytic philosophers who do good work. And like, I'm reading a book by someone right now on Berkeley, which is really good. And mm-hmm. um, so, I mean, there's some good historical work being done there. Um, but I think in continental, there's a little bit more emphasis of like really sort of knowing the whole history of philosophy. Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. And so if you think, for example, of like Heidegger's works, you think of like Heidegger's lectures on Nietzsche. Mm-hmm. I mean, it basically ends up being a confrontation with the entire history of Western philosophy. Yeah. Stuff yeah. in there on Plato. I mean, there's mm-hmm. stuff on Protagoras, on Descartes, mm-hmm. Leibniz, et cetera. So... 
Um, and same with Derrida, you think of like how sort of, I mean, mm-hmm. so like there's much more sort of this sense of like being in conversation with the actual history of mm-hmm. philosophy, yeah, the practice. Um, whereas again, analytic philosophy is a little more like a natural science where like, you know, if I'm a natural scientist, I don't need to study Galileo. Or, <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Kepler or, mm-hmm. or at least not so much. And, you know, so there's this sort of idea that like, well, we've achieved a certain uh, current state of progress and we just need to sort of build off of that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so, I mean, and you'll just, you meet, you meet analytic philosophers where like, you know, they like, like one of my friends, like he hadn't read the discourse on the method. It's like, how can you, really? I just don't even That's know. Wild. That's why. So, but I think, you know, why do you get these sort of bigger tomes in, in continental? Um, yeah, I think part of it is because just there is this conversation that's going, that, like, that's historical in a way it's like, there's a lot to sort of respond to. Like we're trying to sort of take, take into account so many different dimensions of the way philosophers have looked at various issues and aspects of human life. And, um, you know, I mean, but it's a, it's a really good question, uh, Xavier. And I think that, um, uh, yeah, I think that to some extent you have to give like a situational answer, right? Like, I mean, Heidegger does what he does in in being in time because he just he thinks that's what he needs to do to, mm-hmm. uh, you know, to get to where he wants to go. Yeah. And let me say this too. So that's a good, I think, a good point is that there's also this idea that like in continental philosophy, the emphasis is not like work. The concern is about thinking, right? Yeah. And so, like, if you know, it's not really, when we start thinking, it's not really clear where it's going to take us. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes when you start thinking, you know, you, you set yourself up for, for going on a long ride. (laughs) That's right. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I agree with that. Yeah. I see it as, as continental philosophy is, um, I guess one of the reasons, I guess I can make it personal that I'm partial to it is that it's, it, it works kind of like a hyperlink everybody's everybody's building off of each other right so you 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 read um you know you read kant and then you get to hegel and then you read husserl and you read nietzsche and you read heidegger and then you read you know um merleau ponty and jean paul sartre and then you read derrida and, i mean they all kind of they're all building like what the one guy did before them they're like okay they had some really awesome ideas and they're a badass but now i'm kind of thinking about it this way and i'm going to keep going further with what they did and so it's like, oh, okay, now I'm, you know, and you see how the ideas, they start to kind of through time, kind of what you're saying about the history of philosophy, they start to, you can kind of see how they evolve, for better, or for worse, yep. of like, oh, well, wait a minute, that's not, and sometimes you'll have, excuse me, you'll have some people like, it's interesting. So um, there's, uh, it was recently published, I read it two years ago, maybe last year, last year, I read, I don't know, last year or two years ago, I can't remember now. I read the lectures that uh, Heidegger did on Heraclitus. And he's uh-huh. like a, he's a huge dude. And uh, <laughs> the, for the ancients, and he was huge right. for, huge for Nietzsche, huge for Heidegger. But there's this really cool thing. If you read Nietzsche, um, is it Twilight of the Idols? He, he he references Heraclitus not as much as yeah, yeah. in does. Twilight of the Idols. There's a prominent reference. Yeah, yeah, and he's talking all, about all it. the philosophers were wrong about the senses, <laughs> although Heraclitus did a little better than the others. Right, and so that Nietzsche, you can see a lot of you know Heraclitus in Nietzsche, um, his philosophy, the whole becoming idea, and so. But you see it in Heidegger. And so what's really cool is that if you read the fragments of uh, Heraclitus, and then you go and you read Nietzsche, and then you go and read Heidegger on Heraclitus, you get two different ways of interpreting Heraclitus, yeah. which is incredible. Um, and I don't think as much as I love Heidegger, and I like how he, he, he talks about Heraclitus, I 
think Nietzsche probably gets it right. <laughs> um, I think, or he gets it more accurate or closer to what Heraclitus was saying. And, but it's very interesting because you will see the ways in which they're viewing things. And there's, it's almost like this through time, uh, this conversation that all yeah. these big thinkers are having. Um, and then they just share it with all of us to, to think and read about. And so you just see how it builds. I mean, that's one example, but you can, you know, you, you know, you see what like phenomenology did, right. With Husserl and Heidegger. And then you see where it ends up with Derrida and, and Foucault. And mm. so it's just like, Oh, that's an interesting turn. Um, and so, there, yeah. So I think with continental, the thing I like about continental, and maybe this is just some of my background in psychoanalysis, you know, analysis does the same thing. You have Freud, you have Jung, you have the neo Freudians, and then you get the kind of more interpersonal Freudians that, you know, more cu current, which was like a, how do we do a renaissance of sorts, you know, with cohort later in the, the late 20th century right. to early Freud, but in a better way. And so maybe that's why it makes sense to me. But um, Continental is nothing to say anything about analytic philosophy, but Continental is, um, has a better, there's a better arc. It has, it has context. It has a, a reverence and respect and criticism of people before them and then how they build off of it. Where it's kind of like what you're saying, analytic is much different and also with analytic, I think why much in many institutions like analytic philosophy is that it is very technical, very logical, and it kind of maps onto quantitative research, which is what most people love in, in the academy many times. Um, you know, yeah, it, I think there's it, something to say that. And yeah, and again, I mean, I think this idea that it was sort of like, I don't know, like divested of its political substance for, you know, 50 years or so, mm -hmm. you know, give or take. Mm -hmm. and more or less i think that made it sort of like um it made it attractive right i mean mm -hmm. we don't want these philosophers making trouble <laughs> right i actually think that analytic has become a bit more um why well, a lot more actually politically engaged in the last 10 to 20 years and i, I see that as a mm. positive mm. especially since 2016 which was really seems mm -hmm. to have been like a some kind of political awakening for a lot of people yeah I maybe mean, just real quick how do you see it as more politically engaged in the past 10 years analytic philosophy just as an example well, i mean you just uh, you see a lot of great works coming out like um like uh well i mean like one that i teach is kate man's down girl mm -hmm. uh, one example um you, know, you see some of the work like jason stanley's been doing on uh propaganda mm -hmm. and on fascism um and, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff about epistemic injustice mm -hmm. goes back to a book by Miranda Fricker, which I think is like 2007. Mm. Um, so, I mean, just for me, like being in the, I've been in the Academy, I guess, since around, you know, for the past 20 years and like, it, uh, definitely seem like a, it seems to me anyway, that there's been uh, a kind of political turn mm. with analytic, mm. uh, which again, I welcome. I mean, I think philosophers have to be engaged in yeah it, it sounds like you're more <clears throat> you're 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 very pro philosophy in public discourse <laughs> and within society in a good way um yeah i think it's so we need that yeah we need that yeah no, i agree with you on that um okay maybe we'll revisit some of this stuff but let's um let's do some nietzsche so you taught a class well, well, we'll, we'll get, you taught a class on Zarathustra, which yeah. I kind of see as the fifth gospel, you know, it's this kind of it's a very kind strange of book. <laughs> yeah. Before we get into that, um, maybe just, let's just give like a, a very brief snapshot of like, just to remind people of who Nietzsche was. And then uh, maybe like the, the two big ideas he has, which are encapsulated within Zarathustra. So we can talk about them outside of it or when we talk about Zarathustra, but just for listeners, um, how do you which sure. kind of like 30 yeah. second or 60 second overview of Nietzsche, who he was and all that, and why, he, why he's the boss. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Nietzsche was born in 1844 is sort of uh, in a little village in uh, Saxony, uh, Rocken. And uh, he was born into a family of Lutheran uh, pastors. So like on both sides of his family, there were all these Lutheran pastors mm -hmm. and um, his father died when he was really young. You know, it was recognized that he was gifted he went to this school, Schopforda, which was actually very close to um, where he grew up and still uh, still an active school in Germany today. I think one of the oh, wow. best high schools in Germany today. Um, 
Wow. Uh, and you know they had, had a lot of had a lot of scholarships. Then Nietzsche went on scholarship, and I mean he was always just sort of recognized as very talented, and he worked very hard. Um, and he was always starting these little intellectual societies. And, um, but you know, to make a long story short, he was sort of destined for the you know the um, the church. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, but his heart wasn't in it. And so he got into classics, you know, Nietzsche did not train as a philosopher. He trained as a classicist. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, you know, reading lots of Greek and Latin and, uh, Homer and, uh, I don't know what else, Sallust and, uh, and, um, but he gradually discovered philosophy. We mentioned at the beginning of our, our conversation, you know, he discovered Schopenhauer and Mm -hmm. he made this friendship with Wagner and sort of all those things came together to um, to to go into his first book, which was The Birth of Tragedy, um, which he published pretty young. I think it came out. It's the late 20s, right? I think it came out in 1872. So he was like 20, what, like 27, 28? Yeah, late 20s, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, I mean, the, it, the book was supposed to be a work of philology, which is what they call classics. Right. And it was just completely panned as a contribution to scholarship. Mm-hmm. Um, but of course it's a, a work of genius, you know? It's, it's, I love it. I, I, I really like it. He, he, you know, the Dionysus and, uh, uh, yeah the Dion, the the dionysian and the um the apollonian yeah thank you yeah apollonian yeah. yeah and um yeah so i mean it's great and then you know he he got a job like uh, uh like even before he finished his dissertation because mm-hmm. he was just so like he just got such a great letter of recommendation there's like this guy's brilliant you know hire him <laughs> um but uh you know he sort of he was sort of sickly most of his life and he taught, he, you know, he taught like a really heavy teaching schedule at, at Basel for, I don't know, from like the seventies until like 76, 77, 78. And then he just retired from the university altogether. You know I mean? He was still young. He was like, what, like 36 years old or something. Yeah. Like that. Uh, and he just spent the rest of his life, the rest of his working life, which was about another 20 years. No, well, not even because it was like he retires around 76. And by the very beginning of 1889, he's out of commission. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe just over 10, 12, 13 years. He's just got like 13, 14 years. And he just he starts publishing all these books, you know, like Human All to Human and Daybreak and the Gay Science and. And in the early 1880s, thus spoke Zarathustra, uh, and then so on and so forth. You know, Beyond mm-hmm. Good and Evil, and Genealogy of Morality, and Twilight of the Idols, which you mentioned. I mean, just he puts out a lot of books, mm-hmm. and just you know, we can we can talk more about about what, whatever you want, but you know, he's sort of most famous for a few ideas like Eternal Recurrence. Mm-hmm. You mentioned uh, the Ubermensch or the mm-hmm. The sort of overhuman or superhuman, um, and the, the world's, world's power, power world's yeah, power, yeah, of course, yeah, um, and uh, yeah, and the reevaluation of all values, right? So, yeah, and I think the thing about Nietzsche is he wasn't really well received at, in his later years. I mean, he's kind of as a like he wrote his books and like. They, they didn't really sell that well. Like people weren't like <laughs> fawning over him. They were just like, oh, some some books here, some ideas, yeah. and sell, sell it okay, it was fine. And he was in Sils Maria, right in Switzerland, and um, you know, he was in Sils. He was all over. Yeah, I mean, he spent a lot of time in Nice. But, yeah, in, and he went to Italy too, right? He was in Italy. Um, Turin. But, yeah, yeah. So he I don't know. he was a German, but. It was interesting, right? Because he would write about what it means to be German, but he lived most of his life outside of Germany. <laughs> yeah, he was extremely critical of his contemporaries. Right, right which is very interesting. Yes. Uh, um, yeah, so maybe let's just you know, primer on, I guess, his ideas. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on his his main ideas, which you just listed, and then we can do the Zarathustra, which I You're, you're I totally love. right. I mean, his book, he was like the Vincent Van Gogh of philosophy. You know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. He had to, I think he paid, I think he was like 
the fourth part of Zarathustra was like a vanity press, you know, <laughs> have it published. Right. Yeah. Like yeah. Right toward the end of his life, he started to get famous. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. There were the and that's guy- where he got sick with probably um, not meningitis. Um, there's syphilis. this. There's a whole syphilis uh, hypothesis, but that's not con- confirmed. Yeah, yeah. He was sick with something, and uh, something was wrong. Yeah. So tell me, um, your so one of the main pieces of, of his uh, thought is will to power. This is in a lot of his work. Um, right. What, how do you, how do you explain that? I mean, it's, it's tough, but how do you understand it? And how do you, I guess, explain it? Okay. So, I mean, I think the number one thing is like, it's, it's super important to demystify this concept. Cause I think when people hear will to power, they immediately think of like Napoleon or, you know, the third or, Reich or, <laughs> or the third Reich or whatever. Right. Right. And that's not what Nietzsche is talking about. I mean, you know, that, um, like becoming a dictator could be an expression of the will to power, but really all will to power means is it's the will to, I mean, what is power? Power is the ability to do stuff. Mm -hmm. The will to power is just the will to be able to do stuff, to be able to do more stuff, you know, like to be able to create, you know, to be able to paint, to be able to play basketball, to be able to carry on a conversation, to be able to play a musical instrument, uh, you know, to be able to take a take a walk in the woods and appreciate like the beauty of nature. So, I mean, this idea that we just want to become more powerful, we want to become better able to do things. Mm-hmm. So that's one way to think of it. I think first of all, just to demystify it a little bit. It doesn't mean like all power. You know, I'm gonna. <laughs> Yeah, the, t- the tyrannical overlording power, not that. It has to be like some kind of political power or right. whatever. Right. Now, like he does, as you know, like he does talk about it in terms of commanding and obeying mm-hmm. uh, sometimes. But, um, and, you know, and he sort of says like the people who can't command themselves in life have, have to obey. Mm-hmm. Um. But I mean, this, I don't know what you think, but the, to me, this doesn't sound like such a radical idea. No, I don't think it's radical at all. I, I think it's one of those things where it's going to happen whether you see it or not, or, or whether you're, you're actively doing it. So for example, if, you know, if you're going in throughout the world and you're always beholden to whatever society is saying, well, sure, that's, that's going to happen. You can do that. Or you could take more ownership in charge of your own life and do it how you want to do it. And right. of course, you have to operate within a system and you have to operate within how society functions. It's not saying you have to all be anarchists, but it's saying that how do you have of sorts some autonomy in how you're doing doing things within life? Uh, Heidegger talked about it as um, you know, not hiding out in the anonymity of the every, average everydayness, right. right? It's a very similar kind of construct. So. Right, yeah. So well, I think that's a really nice comparison. Because mm-hmm. you sort of think like, oh, if I can't sort of, you know, if I can't sort of di- direct myself, then I can just go along with the the crowd. Mm-hmm. The way of kind, of, which is a way of obey. Right. And Heidegger talked about it as the they, right? And use weird words like thrownness and all that stuff. But yeah, it's. I think it's one of those things where it's, yeah, yeah the command obey thing is, there you know maybe it's a false dichotomy but there's a way of trying to understand basically how are you understanding how you're doing life and it it kind of it 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 sits in it falls naturally i guess you could say into one of those two dimensions and there's more of what is this kind of i don't want to say force but what is this kind of instinctual kind of thing that's pushing you to to do one or or the other in some sense yeah, I mean, and Nietzsche is pretty clear, right, that it's harder to command, right? It's much mm-hmm. easier to obey. Mm-hmm. It's much easier to just go along or... Right, and and there's a, there was a, a human, existential humanist uh, a theorist um, who, who did a lot of clinical work called Eric Fromm, who also oh, believed... Right. In... I, love, I love Fromm. <laughs> yeah, Eric Fromm is great. And he talked about this notion of freedom in this sense where he, you know, he's influenced by Nietzsche too, where he said, look, you know, you, we like to, you know, kind of hand over power to other people to tell us what to do. 
because it's easy and we don't have to think about things. It's escape and, from freedom. Yeah, it's the escape from freedom. And it's that kind of piece of it is much harder to not do that. And but it is probably more healthy and valuable. Yeah. Um, I don't, maybe not valuable is the right word, but probably it's healthier and, and better for at least your individual well being and your kind of sense of commanding your own life of sorts. Yeah. That there is one, I guess, clarifying point here with will to power is he Nietzsche says many times, I believe, it's not the actual will or what we consider will, right? It's not the will to do or not do something per se. It's something more than that. It's kind of uh, behind that. And that's where I think he starts to spend more time on uh, discussing the instincts. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know how you read that in terms of the de delineation. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, yeah, you get, you get into some deep stuff there because <laughs> I mean, to some extent it's like, well, what, like what actually is doing the willing? Mm -hmm. Or like, you know, I mean, one of the questions that's sort of been a longstanding question in Nietzsche scholarship is like, what is the self? Like, mm -hmm. what exactly is the Nietzschean self? Right. And, you know, um, there seems to sort of be some consensus, and I think it, it's right that like Nietzsche views the self as complex. Um, and I think in a way, um, you know, I mean, Nietzsche tends to sort of reduce things to two, right? Mm -hmm. Like Nietzsche likes to talk about like the master and the slave or the uh, herd and the and the I guess, yeah, it's a herd instinct and yeah, the slave morality and mass morality and you know, all that stuff. Yeah, and I think that you know, sort of the idea is that we're all sort of composites of master and slave, right? Like that these elements are at play in us. Mm -hmm. And you know, sort of part of the question is like how to sort of I mean, the problem with the slave morality is that it's sort of like resentful or something. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how do we get beyond uh resentment and sort of I don't know. I mean, it's weird to talk this way, but how do we sort of side with like the affirmative side of our, our psyche? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think this is, well, once you parse through Nietzsche and get some of these, some of these terms can throw people off, but once you kind of get at the essence of what he's trying to say, you know, I mean, I, I see Nietzsche as <laughs> more psychologist and philosopher in many aspects. I mean, well, he, and he he called himself, a, you know, he's in Ake Homo, he's calling himself right. a psychologist. Yeah. And he's, you know, he's one of the greatest in that way. So, but, um, um, how, how about, um, how about, uh, the eternal recurrence of the same? This is also a, a strange concept for most people. And how do you understand this? Yeah, that's a strange one, too. <laughs> um, You know, what's a little weird about Zarathustra is that, like, it's very much it's very much futural in a way, right? Like, it points to the Ubermensch, mm -hmm. and you know, there are all these ideas about sort of self overcoming, and it's it's a philosophy of the future. Zarathustra is always concerned about his children, mm -hmm. um, and he's also I think it's important to say that he's he's uh, he's discontent with the present and the past. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, and that's really the, what motivates him, right. To put his hope in the future, his children. Mm -hmm. So there's this sense that it's like progressive, right. Right. But then the vision of the eternal recurrence seems to call this into question, right. Like, cause is there ever really any progress? Mm -hmm. you know, doesn't the, uh, the little man, I know he's little man, which, um, <laughs> You know, this, there's a Wilhelm Reich book, the Hey Little Man, which is nice. But uh, so, you know, Zarathustra is like, oh, the little man will recur again and again. And this is, you know, um, you know, and this is what I guess makes him weary or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, so what are we supposed to say? Is it like, are we being asked to sort of resign ourselves to the fact that things never change? And sort of just accept the fact that all the bad parts of life will come back again and again, you know, pettiness and cruelty and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or, you know, or is there 
you know, or is there something to this idea that like, no, like humans should be overcome. Like we should try to bring about the Uber match. Mm -hmm. um, you know, is that just a, a futile project if, if we're sort of destined to, you know, repeat the same again right. and again, right. inevitably. Right. It, it, yeah, it does feel, it does have this kind of paradoxical kind of thinking of like, okay, how do we understand, you know, some of what, what is the, the aim or the goal? And I, I feel like there's, maybe not explicitly, but somewhat implicitly, there's this, you know, because of, because of, you know, Nietzsche's amazing, I think, uh, critique of values, right? And especially values that come from religion, uh, namely Christianity. It's like, well, what's our aim? What's our goal? The fact that that's the question, you know, is that the point? Do we have goals or aims for a future? Mm -hmm. You know, how, how is that particularly a critical for us in doing life? You know, could you, could you do life without that? And I yeah. think he doesn't quite clearly state that as such. I think it's more of, he probably, <laughs> you know, how do you, you know, it's not explicitly, yes, that's how it is. But it, but the point isn't, this is the hard part, right? The point isn't the goal, right? You're maneuvering in life and you're maneuvering life with some type of, you know, thing you're working towards. But I think again, bringing Heraclitus into it, it's the process and the becoming of something, right? And I think, you know, generally his goal is, you know, the beyond human, right? How do you become something more than the little man? How do you become something that's bigger, right, than something of yourself? How do you have this command where you're, I mean, really this well-rounded individual that is very much present in moment to moment, but is still forward thinking and forward moving mm -hmm. that is not, that is not suppressed or inhibited by constraints of uh, systems within a world, morals or ethics or things like that, that are going to, to close you down. So my view of reading Nietzsche on morals is always, you know, in theory, morals, I think implicitly have this way of trying to open you up to the world, right? That's their, that's their somewhat of their aim. And most times they close you down. Mm -hmm. If something is closing you down, it's closing the human spirit down. This, you know, this little Heideggerian, the uncovering of who you are, then you have to reconsider, should I have those values or those morals? And I think mm -hmm. that's Nietzsche's main point is, it's not that you don't have morals or values. It's that you don't have the other morals or values. You have your own, which you have realized and found in uh, doing life. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very active, and this is kind of little Hannah Arndt in there, right? The yep. Vita Activa, you know, it's that active way of doing life. And so I think that's, you know, some of this is a little bit of, uh, some of it's explicit. Some of it, I think, is a little more implicit. But those are some of my kind of things I've gathered from all my reading of Nietzsche. And I don't know how you how you feel about it, but uh, yeah, yeah, I think well, it's I, yeah, you yeah. just don't. I mean, I think he's. I think it's what what you say is right. I mean, that you know, the, there's this famous one of the most famous parts in Zarathustra is this er, very early passage on the three metamorphoses. Love that part. Yeah, I love that. Love that section. The lion and the, the child. And, you know, I mean, I think it's clear that like, you know, we take on a lot of moral values, just being growing up in human society, you know, being children, having parents, having teachers and coaches and whatever. Right. Um, and so on. So, um, you know, so we take on a lot of moral values and then, uh, and Nietzsche thinks, well, he, and Zarathustra even says like, and the spirits that are really strong and noble, they really take them to heart most and they take the most of them on themselves. So like, they're the most burdened camels. <laughs> um, and I don't know. And it, and it, but it ends up like, and it gets them into a desert. He thinks. We could talk about that mm -hmm. but then you sort of need this lion to say no 
you know, to sort of, you know, I'm not going to sort of accept these things to talk like, uh, you know, uh, to talk like an American transcendentalist. You know, I'm not going to sort of take <laughs> these things at second hand anymore. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, you know, and I think that's right. I mean, the, what's the, the child is the creator. And I, that, is, that does seem to sort of be the goal is to create. And it's, 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 there's no one way for Nietzsche. There's no sort of universalizable right. moral system. Like good and bad is going to differ from one person to another. And like, mm -hmm. we, we just have to deal with that. Right. And this is, <clears throat> this is why, I mean, again, I'll do a little bit, uh, some critique in here. This is why, I mean, this is why he goes so hard on Christianity, uh, you know, and I think, you know, definitely with Catholicism and I guess Protestantism, but, you know, when you, when you think about, um, uh, for, for some listeners, you know, hold your, hold your belly button. <laughs> um, you know, to me, I agree with Nietzsche on this. I, I totally agree with this. I think there's a lot of value that religion has, and I think it has a lot of, um, <laughs> I guess you could say positive elements to it in terms of society. But I mean, to be honest, I mean, to be just very frank, I think Nietzsche says this, and I would totally agree. Christianity, whether it's Catholic or Protestant, is the most anti-human set of beliefs that we have in society. Because it is very much saying how you are corrupt as a human, and you need saving. And you do have these sets of principles and values that you need to adhere to without any use of your mind or your feelings. In fact, the, the, the human is, <laughs> is sinful. It is damaged, you know, sinfully. The harmartia is the, you know, right. miss the mark. And it's, it's bred it within you from the beginning because of, you know, Adam and original sin and all that. Right. And, it's this disdain for humans, what it means to be human. It, 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 it suppresses all of the instinctual aspects of who we are. And if you take a, you know, there's, you know, certain, uh, there, Nietzsche and Darwin aren't necessarily harmonious, but if you take an evolutionary model, um, the way in which we have evolved on the planet is through our instincts, right? You know, it's in, in one way. So that's one very basic way of saying it. And, you know, when you have a, a system such as Christianity that is determining everything for you and giving all of your answers already, you know, what your purpose of life is, what your meaning of life is, what happens when you die, how you're supposed to live, who you're supposed to fuck, what you're supposed to eat, what you're supposed to, you know, yeah. it is not allowing the individual human to be uncovered, unveiled, and you're not allowed to do life because all of your instincts are suppressed. And so, you know, my, my reading on that is, I think we have it backwards. I think we have, if you think of like an inverted <clears throat> V, right? You have, you know, um, or excuse me, uh, yeah, inverted V is instincts at the bottom and we put cognition and emotion all the ways at the top, right? And with this, this, this eternal battle between these things. And I think it has to be the opposite. I think instinct has to be uh, at the top, and then you have it, it's rooted and anchored in healthy cognition and healthy emotional experience. And when we have that, that's what's driving us to do life. And I think with certain systems or certain cults or certain religions, it's the opposite. We just bury all those things because they're you know sinful in nature. And so, I mean, I follow, uh, as you can tell, Nietzsche real hardcore on, on, on this critique. Cause I think he's right. You know, you can debate all of the theological stuff, you know, to your, you know, blue in the face and that's fine. There's some utility to that, but I think just philosophically, if you will, or conceptually, it's just anti-human. And I think that's not helpful for us as, as a society, as a community and as individuals. But, uh, I don't know how you feel about that. I I'm, I'm very, very harsh on that, but. Yeah, I mean, how do I feel, or what is neat? Ne yeah, yeah, well, both. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my statements that you could disagree, but of course, but um, you know, am I misreading it, or do you disagree, or you agree, or what's your idea? No, I mean, I think it's a good reading. I mean, it's it's 
it's clear that Nietzsche thinks that Christian, you know, you could go for, you can go further than anti-human. Christianity is anti-natural or it's anti-nature. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so no, I think, you know, I think you're, I think you're reading him well. I, I, you know, the, the, the next step is just to sort of think about how, you know, at the same time, Nietzsche does think that the death of God and, uh, you know, sort of the collapse of Christian belief is, is a kind of catastrophe. Absolutely. On some yes. level, yeah, because as bad as this story is, you know, like for all these reasons that you mentioned, it's still a story that mm-hmm. sort of gives meaning to everyone's life, yes, or gives meaning to a lot of people's lives. Mm-hmm. And on top of it, it has a really uh, nice uh, explanation for pain. You know, mm-hmm. there's a lot of suffering. And we all suffer a lot in life. We were talking about it earlier. You know, mm-hmm. it's pretty, pretty bad a lot of the time. Yeah. And, um, you know, human beings are animals that like to ha- have a cause for something. That like to know, Absolutely. like to have an explanation. So you, know, you think about all the different, the various religions and philosophies with like their doctrines of reincarnation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, Christianity you mentioned with the doctrine of original sin and so on and so forth. I'm like, look, there's an explanation. The reason we're suffering is because we deserve it. <laughs> right. We did something bad to deserve this punishment. Because we because we would actually rather that than just be like, no, it's meaningless. Like I'm just <laughs> suffering. Like it doesn't right. mean anything. Right. 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 Because I'm suffering. Right. Right. Um, yeah. And and Nietzsche said that, right? He said, you know, the shadow of God is always among us, right? Or is always ever present, you know, you know, around us. And that's because if you don't, I think it was Dostoevsky that said it, right? You know, if if, if God is dead and everything's permissible or whatever it was, you know, I mean, that's, we have these, I see religious ideas or thoughts um, or systems as a sort of connective tissue for our anthropology, right? It's what connects us through time with different communities and different tribes and different things, you know, whichever religion it is. It is one way of coalescing around something, you know, through time. And well, and it gives me, it gives meaning, I think, to life. Like, you know, it's very common observation, right? That humans are sort of storytelling mm-hmm. animals, and mm-hmm. sort of animals that live on stories. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's part of what Nietzsche is trying to do with Zarathustra is like trying to come up with a new story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because humans are going to have stories. I was thinking about this before we were going to talk today, especially after in light of yesterday's events. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And we have all these like conspiracy theorists and uh, around the world and in the United States in particular, you know, QAnon and so on and so forth. Right. It's like, look, peop- I mean, look, people, if they don't have a good story, they're going to have a bad one. That's right. That's, that's a great way of saying it. Um, and you can say, oh, well, no, it's not these, you know, you say like, oh, it's this or that. You know, and you even think about like, um, you know, they're, uh, like racism as being a factor in this. Mm-hmm. Well, that's just another story. I mean, racism itself is a story. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I agree with you. Good, we got to have good stories. And Nietzsche is trying to come up with yes. what he thinks will be a sort of positive, you know, story. But I mean, it's not, you know, Nietzsche, it's not all sunshine and roses. Like he doesn't. It's, think, it's not. <laughs> um, well, we'll do this. Tell us about, tell us, you know, this is a great, great point. Tell us about Zarathustra. I, I, I'll just, uh, uh, I'll, I'll uh, pitch it to you here. I think Zarathustra is Nietzsche's greatest work. I think he thought it that way as well. Um, I think it's his most important consequential work. And so you put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into that one. And I think it's, I don't tell people to read. I tell people when they were like, they've never read Nietzsche, they're like, what should I read? You know, I'm like, we'll read all of it. It's great. But right. I'm like, read Beyond Good and Evil, because that's usually like the most quote unquote accessible if you will it's really kind yeah. of got some of the biggest stuff it's not long the aphorism stuff is nice twilight's a good one twilight's good but i usually say beyond good and evil and i say Ther- zarathustra it's like just just read those two and you're really you have a good kind of uh 
you know, jumping off point for Nietzsche. And if you want to explore it more, you can, but yeah, but Zarathustra is hard to, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard but it's so essential. So, so tell us, uh, I mean, tell us about Zarathustra. A, it's just a wild and crazy book. Yeah. Tell, tell us I about it. I should, like, I was so into Nietzsche, but like for years I wouldn't read the whole Zarathustra. <laughs> it was just like, my friend would like tease me. He's like, it's too orgasmic for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> um, yeah, so tell us about it. I mean, us, you know, so, the, I mean the, to some the, extent, we've already been talking about it because we've been talking a little bit about like the account of will to power that you get in there, mm-hmm. and um, and about eternal recurrence and the the Ubermensch and so on and so forth. I mean, it's a as you know, it's a weird book because it's like narrative in places, but then mm-hmm. you, know, you know there is a sort of consistent narrative throughout the book to some extent. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so there's some action and he has disciples and mm-hmm. the prologue, there's a lot of action, as mm-hmm. you know, yep. uh, you know, he comes down from his mountaintop mm-hmm. and, uh, he meets with the hermit who doesn't know that God is dead right. and he goes to the marketplace and he proclaims, uh, the, the Ubermensch and the people aren't too interested. Right. And then he thinks he'll scare them with the the last dimensh, the last human. Mm-hmm. Uh, he thinks he'll scare them, but when he describes the last human, they're all very excited and they're like, "Bring us this, little, bring us the last man. Sounds good. <laughs> Let's be content." <laughs> right. Um. So, and then you know, I mean, it's just sort of, you know, and then more stuff hap- happens in the prologue, but and then it's just there are lots of speeches throughout the book on, on lots of different topics and aspects of life. Mm-hmm. So on friendship, on love, uh, on women, which gets Nietzsche into trouble. Yep. And uh, uh, you know, on the state, and so on and so forth. And then you know, he's sort of, keep, and then he keeps sort of doing this movement. He goes back to his mountain for a little bit, and then he comes back, mm-hmm. and ends up on the Blessed Isles. That's right, yeah. And there are some weird, there are a lot of weird episodes, like with the fire dog or the fire hound. And mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's some just weird shit in Zarathustra. Oh, yeah, it's, there's some strange stuff in there. It's, it's, it's odd. It's a, it feels like a strange... I mean, I always conceptualize it as like, you know, I think he meant it that way. It's like a fifth gospel of sorts, right? It's this very like, how are we going to do like parables and how are we going to do like a sermon on the Mount S kind of thing? And we're going to do some narrative. And then I don't know, there's some like fantasy slash science fiction elements to it. Sure. Yeah. There's (laughs) definitely some, there's definitely some pretty heavy like parody of the Bible for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then the fourth part is really, when I taught it, that was actually what I was most excited about. I mean, the fourth part is pretty cool because he actually introduces a lot of characters. Yes. One thing, right? So you yeah. get like, I don't know, we always called him the leech, this guy he finds who's having like the leech suck, suck on his arms or whatever. Mm-hmm. And the two kings who are deposed and yes. the last pope, mm-hmm. and the ugliest man. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and so on and so forth. And so, like, and he's, like, you remember, like, he's, like, running through the valleys and the forests to try and find the source of this cry. And he just keeps encountering these different people and having these exchanges with them. And then at the end of every exchange, he's, like, go up and hang out at my cave and we'll have dinner later. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) And then when he shows up, they're all there and they have a sort of, like, last supper. Mm -hmm. You know, it's clearly Mm -hmm. a kind of parody of the last supper yeah he gives the talk on the higher man mm-hmm. and then uh he leaves and uh, his guests have a little conversation i think when and when he comes back they're worshiping the donkey that mm-hmm. the kings had mm-hmm. so they have the, the the ass festival right um and then it ends with it ends really the ending is really weird too because he it's the well, there's the drunken song, which is very cool. Mm-hmm. And then he, uh, the very end, it's the next morning, he comes out of his cave, and there are like all these doves flying around him. Yep. And then he like reaches through, and there's like a lion, and the lion's like laughing, and Zarathustra's petting him. And <laughs> it's like, My children are coming. Okay. So 
I mean, it's a very, very weird um, book. Uh, and there's just, there's so, there's so much going on yeah. in Zarathustra. It, how do we, how do you, I guess, uh, I guess you can start general and then get as specific as you want. Um, it's a strange, weird book. Uh, and we're, we're probably like underselling it. <laughs> People are like, I don't want to read that. That sounds like a weird book. Um, and it is a little strange to read, but like, what is it about Zarathustra that is so important and so significant? You know, maybe start general and then just get as specific as you want. Well, I mean, don't you think he's, I mean, he's really, I mean, look, it's, it's hard to distinguish between Nietzsche and Zarathustra a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. That's one yeah. thing to say. Yeah. I mean, he's really, he's someone who sort of realized the death of God. He's realized that humanity is in, has come to be in a new situation. And he's searching for a way forward, right, for humanity. Mm -hmm. He sees a lot of the dangers on the horizon. Like, for him, the last man is the danger. You mm -hmm. know, and I think when I talk about my students, like, in a way, like, a lot of us are sort of like the last man, you know, sort of living these suburban lives where we're very comfortable and when things, you know, when things are bad, there are drugs to take the edge off. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, so, uh, you know, we always end up, in my classes, we always end up talking about Wally -E somehow and like that. <laughs> yeah, I could see that. I could see that. that's a fantastic film. That's a great film. I still think it's probably one of the best Pixar films. So like, you know, but this idea that like humanity doesn't really aspire to anything great anymore. We're just sort of mm -hmm. content to be comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. And no. yeah. that's something that I try to push it a little bit with my students is like, what's wrong with that? You know, like maybe we should just, I mean, what is this greatness that Zarathustra is trying to inspire us towards? Mm -hmm. Um, but clearly he cares about that, right? He's worried about sort of the mediocrity of the last man. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess, and he's worried about the fact that we'll just become sick of ourselves. We'll become weary of ourselves. We're just like, what's the point of any of it? I mean, that's what the soothsayer is another one who's a guest at that mm -hmm. final banquet. And you know, the soothsayer is sort of like everything's been done. You know, there's nothing new under the sun. It's all meaningless. There's nothing to do. Yeah. He, he's the nihilist at the party. He's the kind of the nihilist at the party. There's one at every party. And I think <laughs> Zarathustra, I mean, in a way, the whole book is about him trying to find a way forward. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, overall, like, that's the way, like, sort of people read Nietzsche, and I think rightly, is that, like, he sees these problems, and he's sort of, it's not, he's not exactly sure where we're going, but he's trying to find a way forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, I, I read Zarathustra, and I read just Nietzsche's philosophy, as I kind of mentioned at the beginning, you know, it's a philosophy of life, he's trying to, you know, you said it as well, is how do you do life? You know, we 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 spend so much time talking about you know, what are we going to get and how much money we make and how happy we are and what we're traveling. But there's no, this goes back to my kind of like goals and aims and stuff like that. Like, you know, kind of sort of uh, arbitrarily or, or almost using as like a function to just do life. But it's, you know, that's important. Like, how are we, how are we living life? You know, we're not just, you know, kind of, you know, waltzing through it and just kind of being like, okay, this happened. And I guess this happens. And it's like, how are we more actively participant in life? And mm -hmm. I think that's what he's trying to, he's trying to find that. And that's, and that's probably one of my biggest uh, frustrations with people that um, read Nietzsche and be like, Oh, he's just a misanthropic nihilistic, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, you, you're not reading him right. Yeah. <laughs> That's just not, I mean, I get some of it, you know, talks about the suffering and all those things. And people just kind of casually read that. And it's like, oh, this is depressing. And it's, it's not that at all. I, I just, I see it so differently. Um, and, and so I think it's, yeah, how are we, how are we living life? How are we actively do, you know, participating in that and trying to find that, you know, for ourselves, but then in general, um, 
And well, he's <laughs> he's very explicit, right? Everywhere that he's he like he takes himself to be affirmative. Yes. Right. And to be affirming life. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and you, you got, you just got this great stuff. Like Zarathustra is always saying to his disciples, stay true to the earth, mm-hmm. like be true to the earth. And it sort of gets back to this point too, of like, I do think that there's this idea, like grow up, you know, like there's no, there's no, there's no world behind the world. Um, this is all there is in a way, you know, like, uh, don't, you know, don't sort of flee to the, the trend, you know, this sort of transcendent realm. Yeah. Um, and that way it's a very concrete kind of philosophy. Yeah. Right? It's very anchored in, I don't want to use the word no, but you know, you know, it's anchored to the, yes, the earth life as we know it. like, it's very much, like this is this is what this is what it is, right? This is you know maybe we can't explain all of it, uh, and other people will do that, and that's cool. But it's more of like how do we? We're not so interested in the metaphysical, right, um, or the supernatural necessarily. Um, it's more of, or maybe more accurately, not where that becomes the goal, or that becomes a obstruction to how we're living life here. Um, I, I guess you could say maybe that way, but. Well, yeah, I mean, especially if you think back to sort of this idea of like an anti, you know, Christianity or Platonism or Schopenhauer's philosophy as being sort of being anti, all sort of falling under the heading of Mm -hmm. anti-nature. That, you know, um, Nietzsche thinks, well, no, like these things, they falsify the real situation. We should stay true to the earth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I think sometimes, like, you, know, you think about, like, these people who, like, they don't really care about the future of humanity because they think, like, you know, well, we're all going to just sort of go up to heaven anyway. Right. Or, you know, or, like, so, or, like, you know, in its most extreme form, it's like, this world doesn't, this earth doesn't really matter. This is just the veil of tears or whatever. Right. Like, the real action is, mm-hmm. you know, up above yeah, living uh, for all eternity. I, you know, very clearly, Zarathustra was like, "No, like this is, this is what there is." Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, what are we going to do with it? What? Um, so let, let's let's talk about uh, branching out a little bit from Nietzsche directly. So, <clears throat> your understanding of uh, let's bring <laughs> let's bring Heidegger into the picture again. Uh, so Heidegger, I think I have this right. He lectured most on Aristotle, and then Nietzsche was after him. So I don't. Do you have um? There's a two volume series of all of Heidegger's lectures on Nietzsche. Have you read that? Yeah, I do have that. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's, it's great. great. It's really good. David Farrell Crowley. Yes. Yep. 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 Um. Okay. So you've read that, and so you. Know, well, that was an, I actually mentioned it earlier in the in our, yeah. our conversation too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. What What is your kind of reading on how Heidegger reads Nietzsche? Like, do you is he get him wrong or you know? Because because my impression is that Heidegger is looking at Nietzsche through his lens of you know Dasein and being and ontology and you know and that's not quite what Nietzsche was doing. Um, so. You know, um, how do you how do you see? Yeah, this I agree with you. I mean, I agree with you about that. I mean, that yeah, he- Heidegger is. I mean, look, the Heidegger's lectures on Nietzsche are, are worth reading because it's Heidegger. Yes, it's uh, awesome. I, I don't think it's um like wonderful uh, Nietzsche exposition. Mm-hmm. Although you know he has he has good insight into like certain passages and concepts mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. and, and arguments. Um, you know, I mean, he has a weird, he has the, he he had this weird view that like the, basically the knock loss, the, you know, like leftover, you know, all the unpublished stuff. Yeah. He, greater value than the published stuff. Yeah. He spent a lot of time in there in Will to Power, which was the unpublished kind of right. last manuscript that his sister kind of fucked him over on and all that. <laughs> so. Yeah. So that's sort of a weird view. I mean, I don't really... Yeah, I'm not really down with that so much. I mean, I think obviously we can make use of the 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 knock loss, but mm-hmm. I mean, I'm 
you know, I think we should sort of give preference to the published works. I agree. Um, and, you know, I mean, there's sort of this idea that like Nietzsche is the last metaphysician. Nietzsche brings the tradition of Western metaphysics to a close. And mm-hmm. now we can sort of have the new, the other beginning that mm-hmm. Heidegger trying to initiate. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's Heidegger's thing, right? Like Heidegger. That's his thing. That's his thing. <laughs> I mean, like sort of whatever around the period of the turn or whatever. I mean, he starts to get into this thing of the other beginning. and. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't. I mean, I don't know what. I'm. I'm still not sure completely how to understand what he was trying to do. But um. yeah, I, I always see Heidegger as you know. If you want to know Heidegger, there's basically three books. Well, there's really one book you should read, but three books. Um, History on the concept of time is kind of like his early thoughts, uh, yeah. uh, which would be then become Being in Time, and then uh, Being in Time, which he wrote in 1927, Magnum Opus, yeah. huge work. It's amazing. Yeah, I mean that's yeah. a great. And then, um, uh, what's it called? The uh, contributions of the event, or whatever it's called. Contributions to philosophy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that on was the in, event. The, on the event, that's right. That was in the fifties. Or Fami Ragnus. Yeah, I forget where it was. When I actually he, think it was like thirty-eight or something. Was it okay? Maybe it wasn't that late. I actually have it right here. But that's sort of kind of later-ish Heidegger after being in time had been out for you know 10, 12 years. Um, it wasn't and then, that much later, but yeah. And and then because in terms of like major pieces, because I know he wrote, he did a bunch of lectures that have been published, and then he, he end of his life, he was you know he wrote a lot about like technology and how that looks, which is super yeah. interesting. Yeah, I, and I love his essay on the origin of the work of art. It's a great one. That's a great essay. It's really really good. Um, yeah. So there's just those kinds of things, but yeah, his whole thing was. It was just Dasein all the way down your worldhood and all that stuff. But I, I agree. His Nietzsche stuff, he loved Nietzsche, but he just kind of mapped him on to his rubric. And yeah, it's less about exposition of Nietzsche's ideas and more of just like, how can I use Nietzsche's ideas to like boost mine? <laughs> um, you know, for better or for worse. So I guess he was less that concerned about the accuracy. And like you're saying, he was more on the, you know, unpublished stuff than like, you know. Do you, do you, do you have like a favorite Nietzsche, like secondary work on Nietzsche or? Well, no, no. the short answer is no. I know that um, Kaufman does all the, all the stuff. And then. Um, That's uh, sort of a classic, right? A philosopher, a psychologist, the antichrist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a few other things he's written. Um, secondary, no. Do you? Uh, I don't know, you know, I mean, again, the Heidegger is worth reading, but I feel like it's more worth reading because it's Heidegger rather than <laughs> yes. as exposition of Nietzsche. And yeah, I would sort of say the same thing about the Deleuze book. Mm-hmm. Definitely a great book, but I just like, I don't know, as an exposition of Nietzsche. Mm-hmm. There's just been so, there's been so many great books written um, with Nietzsche sort of at the center of them, but I don't know if any of them are really great. Yeah, and I think that there's also expositions of Nietzsche. It's hard to find. I feel like Nietzsche is one of those people. I know that there are, I mean, Nietzsche scholars out there, but I haven't really found someone that's written something that is, yeah, kind of the secondary thing that's like people writing on Nietzsche. That's, you know, kind of more mass uh, publicized and all that stuff. But maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I just haven't, haven't read enough, but. Um, and you, you see this again, too, just kind of following this thread, and then I'll come back to Nietzsche for a minute. You know, Derrida has uh, this book he wrote on Heidegger. Have you read this? Um, the, the Spirit on the Spirit? or um, oh, What was it called? Uh, let me find it. I haven't read it. I've, I've been meaning to. Um, so I can't speak on it. Um, I can't speak on it. Uh, confidently but uh yeah it's a uh, heidegger the question of being in history and so i guess from the seminars that derrida did um i haven't uh, read yeah, it yeah 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 yeah. that <laughs> um, just came out not too long ago in translation yeah in, in english translation i think it came out uh, a year or two ago yeah no i haven't read it yet yeah i haven't, I haven't read it either i've been meaning to but you know just you know i know derrida was very influenced by heidegger um but again kind of for his rubric of how he was doing deconstructionalism and all that stuff um 
but yeah, I know a lot of, a lot of people in a similar way, very influenced by Heidegger. And then they just kind of use him for their kind of agenda of sorts. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he's super, he's super influential for the subsequent continental tradition. Yeah. You know, I mean, in problem, of course, very problematically because of, because of his involvement with the Nazis. Yes. Yes. Someone told me this story once. Uh, the, there was an interview with Levinas, and uh, Levinas is going on about how bad, you know, he's sort of making it sound like things are pretty bad. Uh, and the interviewer says, like, do you really think it's that bad? You know, that things are trending so poorly. And he said, yeah, he said, the, he said the greatest philosopher of the 20th century was a Nazi. So I sort of think it's not going t- too well. Yeah, that's, I mean, just real quick, I guess, while we're on it, um, do you have any, how do you explain that, I guess, you know, when people come to you and they say, like, you shouldn't read Heidegger because he was a Nazi, like, uh, you know, how, how do you usually answer those kind of? I mean, it's really, I mean, it's, you know, but that kind of argument, it's always, like, you know, why, like, should we stop, you know, I mean, Picasso was a jerk, should we stop looking at his paintings? And right. I don't know, I mean... I think that, you know, I mean, I think that like, but here's the thing that's a little tricky. And we talked about like my work on autobiography. And so like I've thought, <laughs> yeah. thought about, about the relationship between life and philosophy. Right. Yeah. And I just don't know if the life is as easily separable in the case of the philosopher. Right. So you say like, oh, you know, Picasso is a jerk, but I can still enjoy his paintings. But, like, can I, I don't know, I think maybe it's a little harder for me to sort of make this disconnect, because I really do think that, um, like, philosophers should be good people. Mm. E- <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yes, um, or maybe. <laughs> well, of course, you could qualify it immediately. First of all, you know, it's as an interesting Plato, question. Yeah, as Plato tells us, like it's you know, human beings can't be good, but yeah. they can try to get close. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how I feel about that. Um, I never thought about it that way, so I just, I don't, I don't know it's tricky i mean you know i mean i think that maybe you know i mean because because another thing is you could say like look heidegger was just politically unsophisticated you might absolutely just that and he he had um he had a very negative view of uh soviet russia Mm -hmm. and of the united states he thought Mm -hmm. that they were like these godless materialistic uh, societies, and I mean, we live in the United States, so we know he was uh, at least right about us. <laughs> um, so he thought that you know the Germany was basically surrounded, and it was bad on both sides. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Germany's sort of in the pincers of like these these godless materialists, and mm-hmm. you know, Heidegger thinks well, like Germany is going to represent for spirit or something like that. So he had these very sort of naive ideas that like Germany was going to be the, it's going to sort of represent a, an alternative to uh, this sort of godless modern materialism. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, you know, you see like some of the, like some of the ways he behaved with like his colleagues and towards Husserl, who had been his mentor and, mm-hmm. uh, some of the things he did when he actually became rector of Freiburg and, you know, and then of course we have the the black notebooks, right? Have come yep. out the Schwarze Hefte, and and we know that like, you know, like he wasn't pretending to be an anti semite to please the Nazis. Like he really was. You know, he had these sort of, you know, and just like, I mean, the mo- like in a way like the most cliched, you know, kind of anti semitism, right? Like you know, oh, you know, Jewish people are rootless, and you know they're not mm-hmm. tied to the whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> The clearing. So, so, there's this like debate I continuously have, which you're touching on, which 
you know, since we're here, I guess we can have it a little bit. Can you separate? Uh, I'll be curious for your thoughts on this. Can we and should we? I know those are very different questions, but can we and should we separate, you know, the art from the artist or the writing from the writer? Right. So if I'm an asshole, yeah, but I'm writing great poetry or I'm writing really good ideas about, you know, uh, epistemology or something, who cares if, you know, I do some heinous things? Does it matter? Well, I mean, is you, maybe I wouldn't put it that way. We would say, like, is it relevant to the evaluation of the work? Right. I, I mean, mean, again, my tendency is to sort of say, like, let's take the work. Yes. But I maybe want to make a little qualification in the case of philosophy in particular. Okay. You know, just because, again, I sort of think, you know, it was important to Plato um, that Socrates was a good person. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it was important to Plato to depict Socrates as a good person. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, I think, it's, I think it's very clear that, you know, the... Uh, the the sort of great ancient Greek philosophers, Plato and Aristotle. I mean, they like this clearly is central to their conception of philosophy, right? Like philosophy is not just about theoretical knowledge, right. it's about actually becoming a certain kind of person. Yeah. So I don't know. I just I I take Plato I agree with Plato and Aristotle on this, I guess. Yeah. I but guess I mean, my... does it mean I'm not gonna read being in time? <laughs> No. <laughs> right, 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 like, right. But like does it give me some pretty serious reservations about Heidegger? Yeah. Definitely. Of course. Of course. Of course. I guess my thing is it's like what I tell people is, and when I, you know, teach Heidegger, I, I teach sections of being in time. It's just like, well, number one, we can't be afraid of ideas. We gotta read ideas. Right? We gotta read ideas, we gotta read thoughts. Now I'm not saying you gotta read every idea and every thought, but if it's a pretty if they're making serious uh, uh, claims or propositions or um, structures about things, you might totally disagree with it on its merits, but you have to engage with the ideas, right? You can't just read things you like. I mean, I guess you can, but I think we should read things that are, um, that have a, a variance. But outside of that, in being in time, Heidegger's not writing about eugenics. I mean, he's writing about ontology. It's just about being and about the world. Like, it's not, you would have to really do some gymnastics on trying to find anti Semitism and being in time. You're, I don't see it. I, you're not going to find anti Semitism. I, I don't think. No. But, well, like, like, for example, if you read the book through the lens of Heidegger wasn't, uh, you know, and, became a Nazi in the thirties. Mm -hmm. Then like, for example, the one chapter I would point to is division two, chapter five. I have it right here. Hold on. Yeah. So if you look at division two, chapter five, it's, if you didn't know, if you weren't looking at it through the lens of Heidegger's biography, maybe it would seem completely innocuous, but like when you do read it through that lens and you know, he's talking about like authentic community and stuff like that, some of it can look a little, some of it can look a little like, eh. are you talking about the one on temporality? Yeah. I, you know, my, I don't have my copy here. No, I'm talking okay. about like the, the design of, uh, of authentic community. I'm talking about, uh, uh, I'll find it on. I wish I had my copy, but it's at my office at school. Yeah, it's okay. It's been a while since I read it, but if you look at that chapter and you like you, and there are, I, I realize there are multiple sections in that chapter, but if you read some <laughs> of the stuff, and especially the stuff about authentic community, if you weren't reading it through the lens of his history, maybe it would just be completely innocuous. But for me, when I read it, I was like, eh, that's a little maybe. Mm. Yeah, that's that's something I'll I'll have to keep in mind. I've never really like I've always known Heidegger was, you know, part of the Nazi party and stuff. But then there's the other thing. And again, I'm not this is what it always comes down to when you try to, you know, explain Heidegger. You're 
you're following Hannah Arndt's footsteps and trying to be an apologist because you like his ideas. Um, you know, but right, the black milk books make this difficult. But before that, <laughs> um, you know, he wrote this in 1927, you know, before all this stuff, you know, before 1933. True. And um, you know, whatever, right? If he had the ideas, he had the ideas beforehand. Maybe, you know, people yeah. change their ideas all the time, you know? So, but even if you read later Heidegger, I mean, I don't think, I, my biggest problem, like, mm, how do I say this? <laughs> it's a little dicey here. I think if you put things in historical context, it makes sense why people joined the NSDAP or whatever. It makes sense, you know. Well, I mean, look, let's say Weimar, Vi- Weimar Republic and Treaty of Versailles, and all like I understand, you know, Germany was almost an extinct country, like it was really bad, like it was a bad time, like it was a really, 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 really bad time. You know, that 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 void breeds space for some pretty awful ideas eventually, like that can happen, and that did happen. Well, I mean, we said, I mean, Heidegger had his reasons, which we were talking about, like like a few minutes ago Mm -hmm. but um you know i mean you know there was weird stuff like do you know this like conversation he had with the jaspers i i I know he's talked with uh carl jaspers uh, but i I don't know the contents of it so jaspers i think actually we get the story from jaspers Mm. and jaspers is like talking to heidegger and he's like how can you like hitler you know, like, how can you like such a basically says a ungebildete un- un- mensch? How how can you like such an uncultured person? Right. You know, because Hitler is just some bumpkin. Yeah, he's a caricature. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so Heidegger, like, how can you? Because I mean, you know, you're modern Heidegger. Like, how can you respect this guy? Mm-hmm. And Heidegger says, "Yeah, but have you seen his hands?" Yeah. <laughs> Weird. So um, weird. weird. It's so weird. Yeah. <laughs> that is such a strange thing to say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, you know, it's it's super weird, and it's just, um, you know, it's just one of those things. I mean, it, it, you're. I think for me, at least, like I'm always gonna I'm gonna read Heidegger, but I'm always gonna have my reservations. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. Um, I think it's always trying to find author's intent. So like, for example, when you read Heidegger, yeah, uh, like his philosophy, you know, what's his intent, right? Yeah. As best we can know through the, the text, right? Yeah. And you're doing some type of exegesis, right? And it's like, well, yeah, he's talking about ontology. He's talking about worldhood. He's talking about yeah. temporality. He's talking about spatiality. He's talking about, yeah. you know, the ontic and the ontical, <laughs> right? The ontological. And, the, you know, he's talking about all those things. Like it's, yeah. You have to engage with those ideas, I think, if you're serious. Um, no, I mean, yeah, I think, you know, uh, agreed. Heidegger, Heidegger is, you know, I mean, uh, to me, he's very worthwhile reading. Yeah, and especially if you do continental philosophy. <laughs> As philosopher, yeah. I mean, I just, so, you know, I mean, it's tough. You have these problems, uh, you know, I mean, same thing, sort of f- foundational uh foundational figure in analytic philosophy frega like, mm-hmm. he, he had anti-semitic views you know yeah and, and wasn't uh you know the problem is like if we start if we um you know the problem is we're dealing with the you know uh, some human beings that aren't uh perfect yeah i i have to think I need well, to think. That, uh, we should say that aren't very good sometimes. Yeah. No. Absolutely. I mean, look. I mean, people can have interesting ideas and be horrible people, and that's why your question is interesting. I don't have a good answer. I need to think about it. But you know, do we want our philosophers to be good people? Uh, I feel like, yeah. For me, I think that the philo- there should there's a different standard for philosophers. Yeah. Well, I guess it depends on your. Are are we saying the the Aristotle type of good, or, you know, how are we defining that? Um, well, I mean, of course, that's a question. I mean, probably par- part of it for that part of like, you know, trying to become good for, uh, within that tradition is exactly having these kinds of conversations and asking those kinds of questions. Like, what do we mean by? Being good? Yeah. I, 
I don't know. I mean, look, there's the part of me that initially wants to say instinctually, of course, yes. Yeah, of course we want people, you know, thinkers and philosophers to be good and good intentions and good, you know, some moral sense of sort. But when I'm trying to be critical, it's like, hmm, do we? Or does it matter? Um, Or should it matter? Um, You know, could you be a horrible person, quote unquote, and still write really good stuff? you know, quote unquote, good stuff, you know, or really good ideas. Like, you know, because, you know, if I, you know, if I go and, and commit a crime or something, but, you know, I'm writing really good stuff about, I don't know. uh, uh, Doesn't matter. Good novels. You're a good novelist. Good novelist. Or I'm, I'm writing a paper about certain clinical syndromes within certain blah, 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 within my field. But, you know, I went and I stole you know, a car or something. It's like, yeah, maybe I'm a shit person, but you know, my research was really good. Yeah. I mean, it's clear that we're capable of making a distinction between the work and the yeah the author or the producer or what, whoever. But, but holding aside the good, you know, which definition of good we're using, even if we're using Aristotle's you know, definition of good, does, why would, you know, why is that important? Well, and there's also, here's another one. I mean, he taught, Aristotle talks about this guy. uh, I think he's talking about Eudoxus in the Nicomachean Ethics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this one's nice. The guy, the guy has bad arguments, actually. Mm -hmm. So his arguments aren't good, but he's a good person. And so the opposite. Yeah, he's a good person. So everyone sort of, so he has adherence to his doctrine, despite the fact that it's defective. Yeah, because I don't. I don't like that either. <laughs> like they're like, oh, he's a good guy. So. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. I have problems with that too. You know. <laughs> yeah. So you that's some, that's another ideas, problem. but if you're a nice guy, it's like, well, who gives a shit? That's another. Yeah. So that's another issue. Yeah. But, no. No. It, it's. Uh, I, I leave it to the listeners to try and sort that out. And I'll just say one quick thing about Heidegger and ask one last question here. <sighs> yeah, I don't like that Heidegger's was a Nazi. I don't. I don't like more so than I mean, you're one of those like obviously it's bad. Obviously, really yeah, bad. obviously it's bad. I don't like it. I don't condone it whatsoever. What I dislike more than that is that he didn't he didn't like afterwards or when it got right. to like the final solution and all that garbage, you know, it was just grotesque ways of treating human life. Like, why didn't he let go of it and be like, okay, like I started out with like the National Socialist Party. Yes, we need yeah. to save Germany. Cool. Okay. Uh, no, nah, no, nah, guys, I can't, I can't follow you down this road. Like, this is too far. This is too much. Like, what, what the fuck are we doing? Yeah. You know, why not did, he, only did he never, yeah, not only did he never, apologize, he never did, even after the war, he never, actually, he scarcely mentioned it. I mean, there are a couple, yeah, which is references to the concentration camps and, that's even worse. It's like, oh, so now, now that you know, you know, Nazis are, you know, this, the whole enterprise was f- terrible and awful, a human uh, stain for us, right? But it's like, oh, you're not going to say anything about it. Like, I'm not saying I need you to like speak for everybody or say, but you're not yeah. going to disown it and be like, I made a mistake or you know, I didn't know yeah. that or that kind of silence does has and does and always will make me uncomfortable it's like yeah. <sighs> jesus yeah. dude, you're making this real difficult here man <laughs> yeah Xavier, that's, are cool. a, that's a good point right because he had an opportunity of course of yeah. course you know and and i mean i point to hannah on this right you know hannah got a lot of heat for this right because they're like you're defending you know you're a german jew and you're defending this fucking nazi what is wrong with you um, and then you get all her stuff on you know, Eichmann in Jerusalem, and they're like, you're going to blame us as well? Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Because she got a lot of heat for that stuff. Um, you know, so yeah, I mean, I... Controversial. Yeah, so I, I... Again, for the record, I like being in time. I think it's good ontology. I like studying it. Um, but I, you know, I, I do not condone or like the fact that Heidegger was a Nazi or part of the Nazi party or that he didn't but renounce it after it's, it's a great book. I mean, I, I think, yeah. you know, everyone should read it. I mean, it's, it's for me, momentous for me. Like it's definitely one of the books that like, you know, like it, Heidegger didn't like to talk in terms of worldview, mm-hmm. but I think, um, 
being in time constitutes a kind of worldview. Oh, it's yeah. one of these books that, like once you read it, it just it changes your whole life. And yeah, it, of- you, you can't unsee that perspective anymore. Yeah, it's just, it's just like it just hits you like a Mack truck, and it's like, how did I not think about life this way? How did I not see this before? And then you're like, whoa! Like even you don't do, you don't like it, you don't agree with it, but you can't not unsee it. And it's just like, whoa! I mean, it's just it's momentous. And so, but yeah, I I don't like well, he was for me, a Nazi. That's what great that's what great philosophy does, right? Is that mm-hmm. it's a it's a whole worldview, right? I mean, these are right. just like different ways of let's so whether you want to talk about like Spinoza or Schopenhauer, or Plato or Heidegger. Like you read these books, or Freud is a great example. Like, it great gives example. you uh it gives you one more way of understanding reality. Mm-hmm. And and when you yeah, I mean it those people are special for those ideas, you know. And and so this is why I keep pushing back on that. Like, do we want philosophers to be good people? I yes, I have a I have a a, a yes with a footnote. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I'm not saying that like we should stop reading Being in Time. I'm just saying that right. like that's you, you we can read Being in Time, but I want to I at the same time want to maintain that we should want our philosophers to be good good people, whatever that means. And of course, you're right to ask the question, what do we mean by? Yeah. Yeah. I think we should read being in time and maybe we can say that Heidegger was, um, you know, fucking awful for not pronouncing the Nazi party and the, you know, that's yeah. terrible. We should condemn him for that. But, um, but being in time and his ideas in there are, are interesting. So it's that whole thing of person and work and stuff. Yeah. I guess the, the last question I have is, um, you know, kind of uh, more currently, right. Uh, we talked about it at the beginning, how do we, how do we do philosophy or how do we understand these, you know, men and women that have studied philosophy over, you know, uh, many centuries, the Greeks and even 20th century philosophy? How do we, how do we have some applied or pragmatic application of that, um, you know, in our society currently? You know, how, how do we just kind of a general uh, platitude, if you will, how do, how do we, how do we do that? Well, I mean, I think it's a great question and it's a really, um, I think it's an important question because I, I really do think that philosophy has like, a, has a positive role to play in like American society, for example. I'm really excited about like the, um, the work that uh, a lot of people are doing, uh, teaching philosophy in K through 12. Yeah. Yeah. Especially in elementary school. Mm-hmm. Um, so like I, maybe you know but like one of the centers for this is the university of washington in seattle Mm -hmm. they have the center for philosophy for children and it's just great they're doing great work i mean seattle is a great city for this Mm -hmm. um you know i'd like to like to see uh you know like to see a lot more of that like throughout the country Mm -hmm. you know as um i mean perhaps it's somewhat similar with psychology i know it's similar with geology because often we don't teach geology in high school Mm -hmm. We don't teach philosophy in high school. So like when students come to university in the United States, um, they often don't even know that philosophy exists Mm -hmm. um, just because it's just not something that that they have any exposure to like prior to college. Mm -hmm. So I really like that. I think that's super important. I think, I hope there will be more work uh, towards introducing, you know, philosophy and uh, logic as well, which is traditionally sort of part of philosophy in yeah. um, K through 12. You know, we need to, I think, you know, it's, a, it's a, a truism, but we need to do a better job of educating people in this country. Yeah, absolutely. And especially with social media and like the sort of, um, you know, the sort of uh, way that ideas spread so quickly and broadly now. Um, you know, I mean, it may be a bit naive, naive to think like, oh, well, we give people some courses in critical thinking and they'll be less susceptible to these conspiracies. But I, I've had that debate. <laughs> I've but had I that think debate. there's some, I think there's, it's probably worth trying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't think it's a panacea. It is, you know, one size fits all, you know, you know, but um, no. I think it's good. I think it's helpful. We should do that. We should have aspirational at least do that. but. Um, 
you know, it's going to be a lot more than that too, but it, it should be at least that. But, um, but, the, but yeah. the other thing you could say is that, um, you know, we don't always have to be so utilitarian about it. We could say like <laughs> mm -hmm. philosophy is, is just sort of intrinsically good and enjoyable. And it's something we should want like our children and uh, fellow citizens to experience, you know? Yeah. It's like what I said at the beginning, I think is, you know, we're doing it already, whether we realize it or not. And I think you just need a better system or a better yeah, no, it's hu true. Hu heuristic or a better hierarchy of, of understanding it. It's like, Oh, when you're asking, like, you know, you can take a basic example. It's like when people are like, well, well, that's not true. Well, this is true. And then, you know, well, how do we know that that information is really true? Like people are always talking about truth yep. and it's like, well, how do you understand <laughs> truth? Right. And it's like, I don't want to do philosophy. And it's like, no, no, no. You're already asking the right yeah. questions and you already instinctually and intuitively care about the truth. Yeah. You know, why? And what are the dimensions of truth? Right. Yeah. You know, and, you know, well, so I mean, like, stuff well, like that. just, just all, I mean, like, so we did, I mean, and people who've taught philosophy for children say this all the time. They're like, it's amazing the questions children ask and the 100%. discussions that absolutely and like and i i mean i taught a fourth grade class once and it was just it was unbelievable like the yeah. things that the students were saying is like some of them were like coming up with like descartes you know, <laughs> doctrine of the soul or like you know or descartes critique of plato's doctrine of the soul and like, fourth <laughs> that's grade. wonderful that's wonderful yeah like, yes. okay well like that's pretty good one, one of the things i love about children is they have a view I no longer have anymore. So I just love hearing their ideas. Yeah. You know, everything's so new and novel and, and you know, just the wonder of it. And I, I don't have that anymore. You know, in some ways, I try my hardest not to be jaded and cynical. But, yeah. you know, I've experienced life and I've, you know, seen some of those things and, and they haven't yet. And there's this kind of, I don't want to say innocence or purity, but there's this kind of, you know, wonder about things. And uh, so they ask questions in different ways than we do now. And that's... um you know, I think that's something special to to tap into and to be like, yeah, how, how do we know that? And that's a good question. And yeah, um, I love stuff like that. That's great. Um, David, you have been more than generous with your time. Uh, I, this was this was so much fun. Yeah, I, I really enjoy I, it. If you yeah, if you haven't absolutely. noticed, I, I love philosophy. I, I know I do clinical psych, but I, I really do love philosophy. Um, and it's 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 so, so much fun. Uh, talking about these ideas with you, you're, you're, you know, very brilliant and and have a really nice way of explaining the arc and contextual aspects of philosophy and things like that. So tell, I appreciate you coming on and, you know, tell people where they can find you and any things that uh, you want to, any place you want to point them to, whether online or some of your work or whatever, any, anything you want to let listeners know? Oh, well, just, you know, you can, um, I, I'm easy to find online. <laughs> Like, okay like anyone <laughs> okay and uh yeah thanks i so i so uh appreciated uh this this was nice you know i've been on sort of holiday for the past couple of weeks so i haven't had a chance to talk philosophy so <laughs> yeah me too i i this was i also was on break till monday and so i uh this was uh got my gears going for you know when i teach class starting next week so it will be fun and thanks for making me think so much I <laughs> know. Same thing with you, man. I mean, I, I will. I know I will go back after this and think about many of our questions and thoughts and stuff. So it was real, real wonderful. So always welcome to come back, talk anytime, or you know, just try out ideas. So I uh, look forward to Great. it. Thanks, Xavier. All right, man. Thank you. <laughs>